Now let's take a closer look at catching and the developmental sequence for this type of manipulative skill. Catching is the most common fundamental manipulative skill and is used commonly in activities of daily living and in sport and recreation. Catching involves gaining control or possession of an object or stopping it with an implement. For example, catching with one or two hands, stopping a grounder with a glove, or trapping a puck or ball with a hockey stick. Objects that are caught with the hands may then be manipulated. For example, you can catch a ball and then dribble it. Intercepting an object in flight is much more difficult, and as we saw with kicking a moving object, one must understand the movement of the object in order to correctly time your movements to intercept it. What makes intercepting objects in flight or off the ground more difficult is that the object is not just moving linearly, but moves in a parabola or an arc in the air. Therefore, you have to estimate both the horizontal and vertical distance in the flight path. The task and the environment greatly affect the degree of difficulty for catching objects. For example, it's easier to catch a large versus a small object, or a slow versus a fast-moving object, or a grounder versus a pop-up. Let's examine developmental differences in early and proficient catching. Early catching often reflects the skill of the thrower getting the ball or object to the outstretched hands of the child. For example, a child may not be able to catch a ball I threw at him if the throw is very poor. Inexperienced children hold their hands and arms in a rigid position. The arms are straight out and the fingers are spread wide. Little force is absorbed in this position. As a result, even well-thrown balls may bounce off the body before the child is able to react and trap or catch the ball. Inexperienced children sometimes turn their head away or close their eyes as the object approaches. In contrast, proficient catchers use soft hands or their hands give with the ball to gradually absorb the force. Experienced catchers also move from side to side or forward and backwards to intercept the ball and correctly place their body in the right position to catch. Experienced catchers modify their hands and finger positions in response to the vertical height of the object. For example, their fingers are pointed up for balls that are thrown high, and their fingers are pointed down for balls that are thrown low. Now let's look at the developmental changes in catching action. Let's first examine the arm action. In step one, there is little response in the arm movements to the ball or object. The arms are rigid and have little give. In step two, the catcher hugs the ball with the arms. In step three, the catcher scoops the ball. In step four, the catcher's arms give to absorb the force of the ball gradually. By around the age of eight, most boys and about 50% of girls can achieve level four of arm action. On the right, I have shown the observational plan for the arm action that was originally described by Hobbin Stricter, Branta, and Seafelt in 1983. You can use this plan to identify which level of arm action the catcher exhibits. The cartoon on the left shows that the arm action is in step three because the arms scoop the ball upon receiving the ball. Now let's look at the developmental changes in catching for the body action. The body and hand actions were first detailed by Strohmeyer, Williams, and Schaub George in 1991. In step one, the catcher makes no adjustments with his or her body. In step two, the catcher makes awkward adjustments with his or her body. These movements may be in the wrong direction or too slow to intercept the ball. In step three, the catcher makes proper adjustments with his or her body. The catcher moves forwards and backwards or laterally to intercept the ball. Around the age of eight, catchers begin to make body adjustments to intercept the ball. Around the ages of 11 to 12, catchers appropriately adjust their body 80% of the time. Again, on the right, I have shown the observational plan for the body action. You can use this plan to identify which level of body action the catcher exhibits. The cartoon at the top shows that the body action is in step one because there is no body adjustments to the ball. Now let's examine the developmental changes in catching with respect to the hand action. In step one, the catcher's palms are facing up. In step two, the catcher's palms are turned inward. In step three, 
the position of the catcher's palms and fingers adjusts to the position of the ball. So for example, if the ball is thrown high, then the fingers point up, and if the ball is thrown low, the fingers point down. Around the ages of 11 to 12, catchers can adjust their hand position about 40% of the time. It's worthwhile to note that around this age, about 80% of catchers can adjust their body. This suggests that adjusting the hands is more difficult than adjusting the body and tends to develop later. Again, on the right, I have shown the observational plan for the hand action. You can use this plan to identify which level of hand action the catcher exhibits. The cartoon at the top shows that the body action is in step one because the hands are facing up. The fingers are held rigidly. When trying to assess catching level or skill, you must remember that task and environmental factors affect the difficulty of catching. So in order to make comparisons in the developmental levels, these conditions must be consistent or held constant. For example, you must consider and keep constant task constraints like the object size or shape and the speed or trajectory of the ball to be caught. You must also keep environmental constraints consistent as well. For example, you must catch the ball either inside or always on turf or on a regular grass field. To assess catching proficiency, often assessments use product scores. This could be the number of catches in a set of attempts to catch. So for example, if I toss a beanbag to a child and he caught 5 out of 10 attempts. However, as we have discussed, with observational plans, we can get information about the process or how the child catches and the developmental stages exhibited by different parts of the body. One major rate limiter in the development of catching skills is the development of anticipation. What I mean by this is that one must correctly time his or her movements to the movement of the external object. In other words, you must predict the flight path of the object to be able to move your body to the correct spot to catch or intercept that object. Coincidence anticipation is the ability to move your body to correctly anticipate or predict the arrival of a moving object. In other words, your arrival to a particular location coincides with the arrival of the object. To do this correctly, you must actually initiate your movements ahead of intercepting that object. And you need to predict the correct position and the timing of when you need to move or how fast you need to move to catch that object. Moreover, just like all catching skills, the ability to intercept a moving object depends on task constraints like the size of the ball, the speed, the trajectory or path, and environmental constraints. Several studies have investigated the development of coincidence anticipation and have found that several factors influence children's abilities to intercept objects. For example, McConnell and Wade in 1990 found that children's accuracy decreases with increased distance from the interception point. Isaacs in 1980 found that young children are more successful catching large versus small balls. Durant in 1985 found that high trajectories are more difficult for young children to catch. Interestingly, the effect of object velocity was mixed. Fast speeds are difficult if the flight path is short where slow velocities are difficult when the flight path is long. Taken together, it seems that the easiest scenario for a young child is to catch a large ball close to the interception point with a low trajectory and with a medium velocity. From a perception action perspective or dynamical systems perspective, catching involves constantly changing interactions between the person, the environment, and the task. However, there are some things that are stable and can help the catcher become better at catching across different types of situations. First are what are called invariant patterns. Invariant patterns are stable aspects of the movement kinematics of the person or the objects in the environment. For example, we know how objects move with respect to gravity. Second, as an object approaches, the visual picture expands on the retina. Whereas when objects move away from the viewer or the object retracts, the visual picture contracts on the retina. This is called the expanding optical array. 
Researchers investigating coincidence anticipation timing suggest that this ability may be due to the expanding rate on the retina or may have something to do with understanding changes in visual information. In adults, the use of visual information, and particularly using gaze information to catch balls of different vertical trajectories, has been examined with baseball players. For example, McLeod and Deans in 1993 and 1996 found that fielders used a ratio based on the elevation of gaze angle to accurately position themselves to catch a ball. The goal was to keep this ratio approximately zero. So for example, if the ratio is positive, the ball will land behind the catcher. If the ratio is negative, the ball will land in front of the catcher. In this image at the bottom, if the catcher is in position 1, then the gaze angle will be negative, which means that the ball will land in front of the catcher. He must move to position 2 so that the gaze angle becomes closer to 0. In position 3, the catcher will appropriately have a gaze angle around 0, which means that he will be able to land exactly where the ball will be caught. In addition to vertical gaze angle, one must also position the body laterally to correctly anticipate the object. To do this, one must use a constant bearing angle. The fielder can keep this visual angle close to 0 by moving sideways to intercept the ball. McBeath and colleagues in 1995 and 2002 found that fielders incorporated both elevation of gaze and horizontal angle of gaze to correctly intercept balls at different vertical and horizontal trajectories. Taken together, these different studies suggest that a catcher must move to stay under the ball's trajectory. If the ball's path appears to arc up and past the catcher, the ball will land behind the catcher. If the ball's path appears to arc down, the ball will land in front of the catcher. These unconscious calculations must be learned through feedback from successful and unsuccessful catches across practice and across development. Importantly, variable practice helps children learn to catch more efficiently. For example, throwing balls with very high trajectories, like with pop-ups, or low trajectories, like grounders. But anybody who has coached t-ball, baseball, or softball with young children should not be surprised by any of this information. When we look at catching at the other end of the aging continuum, we would predict that older adults would be able to catch or intercept balls well if they gained experience during childhood and adolescence. Although older adults may have sufficient experience to compute where they should place their body in order to intercept an object, they may not be fast enough to time their movements to be successful. Haywood in 1980 and 82 found that better performance is observed for more active older adults compared to inactive older adults. Wigand and Ramella in 1983 found that older adults can improve catching performance at a similar rate as younger adults over extended practice. And Haywood in 1989 found that 66 to 73 year old older adults improve their coincidence anticipation with extended practice. Taken together, these studies suggest that both the perceptual and motor aspects of catching and intercepting objects can be improved or practiced in older adults, and that by staying active and practicing these skills, older adults may maintain these skills over time. Before wrapping up this chapter, we should say a few things about another highly complex manipulative skill, driving. Driving is a great example of a complex manipulation skill. Driving involves multisensory integration, meaning integration with vision, hearing, and somatosensation. It also involves attentional focus, experience, good reaction time, and coordination and all of this happens in a changing environment. Although there is not a lot of research investigating the development of driving during adolescence or young adulthood, driving has been studied a lot in terms of driving in older adulthood. This is a very contentious issue because the loss of the ability to drive results in a loss of independence in older adults. However, increased accident rates have prompted the study of problems that older adults may have when it comes to driving. Research has consistently shown that older adults have difficulty dividing attention while driving. 
Older adults take longer to plan movements and are slower to execute movements in the context of driving. As a result, depending on an individual's degree of impairment in these basic motor processes, driving may not be safe. However, this should be examined for each individual because as we have seen with many other types of skills, many healthy, active older adults are able to maintain their motor skills into older adulthood. Okay, let's sum up everything we've learned with respect to the development of manipulative skills. First, we have discussed the developmental changes in reaching and prehension and have found that reaching and grasping objects doesn't really follow a linear or consistent developmental pattern. Infants learn by doing. They test out different solutions to learn to control their arms under different situations. Second, in contrast to reaching and prehension, catching and intercepting objects appears to follow a developmental sequence that can provide process measurements of skill acquisition. Lastly, across experience and with continued practice, individuals may improve and maintain manipulative skills over time.